Uh, we're going to do things a little different. I've got a word that I want to share with you, but I also have some testimonies I want to share with you. And so I'm going to start with the word, and then we'll toss to a testimony, and we'll just see what God wants to say to us. If I were to give this message a subject, it would be on the front line. Ooh, y'all saved. Somebody already felt it. I'm in Judges 14, Judges 4. I know, Sarah, you probably got stressed. It's 4, it's not 14. Judges 4, verse 19 through 22. Perspective is that at this point in the text, there is a man who was on the run. God has decided that Barak, one of the commanders in the army, would capture this man. And this man is on the run. He's trying to avoid being captured. And in the process of trying to avoid being captured, he runs into this woman's tent, thinking to himself, this woman, her name is JL, and he's thinking to himself that if I can get in this woman's tent, I can be undercover and they'll never find me. And verse 19 begins, it says, then he said to her, this is Cesare, he says to her, please give me a little water to drink for I am thirsty. So she opened a jug of milk gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, stand at the door of the tent. And if any man comes and inquires of you and says, is there any man here? You shall say, no. Then J.L. Heber's wife took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And then as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with the peg in his temple. Father God, you gave me a word and you told me it was for not just the women in this room, but the women watching from literally all over the world. And so, Father, I pray that you would bring me into alignment with how this word is supposed to flow. You know my plans, you know what I studied, but we want nothing more than to be in your will and to be in your way. And so, Father, let us flow as you flow. You know for me, God, help me to settle into this thing. And I pray, God, that you would begin to open the hearts that need this word the most, that they would receive that which only you can give them, to be seen, to be valued, to be motivated, to repent, and the direct us over to you even more. And we say, have your way, great God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can I tell you all, first of all, can we give a hand to the band? Give a hand to the band. You're amazing. Thank you all. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. God bless you. And the worship team, let me tell you something. You all do a thing. What I love so much is that even though Dallas is having the International Leadership Summit next week, and so the team is so busy getting everything together that I was like, let's just see if we can go to LA and have Hey You in LA. But do you know that there are members from the Dallas team who literally flew in? If you're from the Dallas team, can you just stand up for a minute? Stand up, go on, make it awkward, stand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you guys for coming out. We love the family, we love the connection. Okay, 1997, I was nine years old. And like, I don't know if any of you all are in that millennial stage of life where you begin to realize like, I really had no business watching and listening to some of the things like, like I'm grown enough now to understand that I had no business watching that. But I was watching it anyway, I was watching the movie G.I. Jane, and then this, have you seen it with Demi Moore? Okay, so here I am preparing for a battle I'm not even eligible to be a part of. For those of you who haven't seen it, in the movie Demi Moore, she is in training to join the Navy after there has been a ban against women. And so she's going through the tough, brutal process of being a member of the Navy. And she's like, but cut her hair off, buzz cut. She's doing the push-ups. Like she's trying to prove that she can be like one of the guys. 
And I think I love this movie so much because we got to witness this woman's commitment to dismantling patriarchy and showing that women can do some of the same things that men can do. And I love this so much because when I was studying for our text and I was praying and I was asking God about what it is that I needed to share at Hey You, he just gave me these words like on the front line. Didn't really make a lot of sense to me until I began to pray and look at the state of just the world and the kingdom right now. And God told me that there are women who are going to be coming to Hey You who are maybe watching online who don't even realize that they are on the front line. Now, whenever you begin to declare things like, I want to break a generational curse, or I want to change the way things are done in the industry, or I want to climb the corporate ladder, you think that you're talking about a goal, but what you are doing is volunteering to be on the front line. In March, it's Women's History Month. And we celebrate all of these women who have made incredible impact on the world and on global stages. But I think very few people realize that the cost of being historical means that you have to be on the front line. One thing that we know for sure is that in many ways, patriarchy has allowed women to believe that their best space is in the background. That if you stay in the background and you aren't on the front line, then you are in a woman's place. I wrestled with this a little bit because when I hear about women being in the background, I think I automatically think about people who are not necessarily visible from a public level. And yet as I was studying, God showed me that that's not necessarily what it means to be in the background. A lot of times we think that being in the background may be doing things that people don't fully appreciate, but you allow things to happen logistically. But God told me that you could be on the main stage and still be in the background if you are conforming when I told you to transform. Some of the people who we think are maybe the most notable in their careers, in their field, who have the most standout power, don't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that their standout power translates into standing out in the kingdom. So you can be popular in one sector of the world, but not be a blip on the radar in kingdom because you're not really on the front lines of what God is doing in the earth. If you cannot say with real certainty that I'm on the front lines of what God is doing in the earth, then you must be willing to ask yourself, then what am I on the front lines of? I was thinking about this. How even though we have goals and we have objectives, that most of the time have to do with our external gifts and talents and how we want them to impact the world, that we cannot really move into a position where we can be trusted with the power, the strength, the innovation, the resources to make that happen unless we are willing to be on the front lines of who we need to become in order to make it happen. I gotta go to my notes because I wanna say this right. If you do not allow yourself to be on the front lines of what needs to happen in your own soul, then you will lust for something happening outside of you, not recognizing that the real battle needs to take place inside of you. That means that if you know that you are governed by fear or inadequacy or anger or bitterness or pride or ego, until you successfully get on the front lines of what needs to transform on the inside of you, we should stop asking God to put us on the front lines of what's happening outside of us. Because the type of weight that you need to have in order to be on the front lines of what God wants to do in the earth requires that you be sure enough on the inside that even when fear talks, it can't control you. Or even when shame tries to move you out of position, you're steadfast and unmovable because I've done the work to be on the front lines. You see, it's not necessarily that you ever get to a place where you no longer have the fear, where you no longer have the insecurity, but you stay on the front line long enough 
to realize that that fear is just a boogeyman because when I allow my faith to be on the front line when fear starts talking I outlast the fear I keep showing up regardless of what the inadequacy says because at the end of the day I have made a decision that I am not going to move out of the position where God has placed me and that means sometimes I got to face off with my own doubt sometimes I got to face off with my own insecurity sometimes I got to face off with the paradigm that once held me stuck but when I get finished facing off I recognize that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world so when we were thinking about the conversation that we wanted to have tonight I asked them to help me find some women who have had to face off with fear and uncertainty because sometimes you don't believe it when it comes from someone who you think has it all together sometimes you need to hear that the very woman sitting next to you has faced off with fear and came out on the other side you know I know we are in cool LA and you know this is my city I love this is my city lived here eight years from Texas this is my city but we're going to have old school testimony service for a minute if there's somebody in this room and you know that you know that you know that you have faced off with a fear and you've come out on the other side can you just take a minute and send a round of applause in this room so that the women understand that he's still slaying giants. If there was a generational giant in your family that you thought for sure was going to take you out, but you trusted that God had equipped you to come out on the other side, I want you to make some noise because there's another woman in this room who was wondering if God is still performing miracles. God, are you still empowering us to overcome? And sometimes it takes a woman to go and get another woman to let her know you really can't have your mind back. You really can't have your peace back. Depression is not the end. Suicidal thoughts can go away. Anxiety doesn't get to control you. I'm not talking about what I heard. I'm talking about what I know. I know that I know that I know that I know that he will help you stay in perfect peace. I know that I know that I know that he will always provide. See, because until you face off with the way that you talk yourself out of where God has positioned you, then you don't even need an outside enemy. You're talking about your haters. God says, but you are your own hater. You won't give yourself an opportunity to step into the fullness of what I have for you. I want to show you a testimony from a woman named Ashley who knows very well what it takes to face off with fear. Hi, I'm Ashley, and the way that power is moving in me from fear to faith in this season is very interesting. I am what you could kind of consider a classic recovering overthinker. So even now I'm sitting here, I'm making this video. There are so many thoughts that I've had to quiet in order to sit down just to do this, right? But I am in this space where I'm like, if I'm gonna have any fear, it's not gonna be fear that holds me back. It's not gonna be fear that causes me to be stagnant or to overthink, but I would rather create a healthy fear that says that if I am not in the center of God's purpose, Perfect will having the fear of who will I not become because I am paralyzed by my thoughts because I'm paralyzed by sometimes feeling like an imposter or not knowing the full plan and so even recently that looked like me leaving LA after nine years to move to Dallas Texas and not really knowing what was ahead of me but I knew that I had a word from God and I knew that I had have, have built such a relationship with God that I can trust him even when I don't see the details of what it is and so right now I am so committed to not living or existing in an expired space where 
where the power of God and the grace of God no longer exists. That whether that is God saying, I need you to physically move, whether that's God saying, I need you to move out of this friendship circle, whether that's God saying, I need you to move your mind and move your thoughts and move the limitations that you place on yourself. That is how fear, going from fear to faith is really working in me. And that's requiring me to own who I am in such a way that I am now redefining and relearning things about myself that I may have forgotten and really getting out of my own way, renewing my mind, renewing my thoughts, renewing just the the pattern of what I thought life should be. And it is birthing something that is very unfamiliar. Some days I gotta cry it out. Some days I'm filled with joy of where I'm headed. But the trust and the foundation of trust that I have in God and the power of who God is, is what is moving me forward. It's what's moving me ahead. And it's currently how power is moving in me. Ashley, stand up, wave at the people. One of the things that stood out in my mind about Ashley's testimony is that she made a decision. Oh, God, help me. She made a decision that allowed her to move in the direction of overcoming what was standing in her way. I was thinking about the context of the theme about becoming powerful in God and I thought to myself, how do we get the power to move in the direction of what God has for us? I wanted to make it as practical as possible for you. And God told me the first thing that is required is that you have to make a decision. If you think about it, no power can really come to anything until you make a decision that gives your power a target. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. You know how you go back and forth about if you're going to text somebody back. (laughs) I didn't even say who, I said somebody. (laughs) The girls who get it, get it. (laughs) The girls who don't teach us. (laughs) You make a decision, you're going back and forth, and then the moment you make a decision, you usually say something to yourself and you're like, I'm gonna go ahead and do it or I'm not gonna do it. And in that moment, you then have the power to follow through with whatever your decision is. That's why the war will always be over your mind because your mind is the place in which you make a decision. Scripture says to set your mind on things above. It doesn't say to vacillate between things above because if you set your mind on things above, then you have the power to move in the direction of where you have set your mind. That woman with the issue of blood was so powerful that Jesus had to make sure that she understood exactly what allowed her to get her healing. It wasn't just that she touched the hem of his garment. Jesus says to her, your faith has made you well. But she had to make a decision before she was even in that situation that she was going to be well no matter what she had to go through in order to get to well. Oh, that's so good. You see, because that woman should have gotten discouraged somewhere along the way. I've had the issue for so long. I've gone to physician after physician and no one could heal me. It should have changed her mind. But for some reason, this woman was so sure of the decision that she did not allow failure or disappointment to make her change her mind. I hear God saying that if you are going to become powerful in God, you are going to have to make a decision about the direction of where you need power and if you are going to make a decision in the direction of where you need power then the decision should be in the direction of where God's power can back you up you see there are some things you can do with your own power but when you have an assignment that only God can fulfill you need God's power in order to get it done God I will set my mind on where you're sending me but I'm going to need your power to get it done and that's when God says I can get behind that because now 
now we're in the same synergy. We've got the same frequency. We want the same thing. So when you start talking about breaking a generational curse, I hear God saying that the enemy will try and convince you to change your mind about who he already said that you are. But when you decide to set your mind, it doesn't matter who they knew before you set your mind. It doesn't matter what they've known or come to expect from you. I don't know about you, but I've had to set my mind on some things. And anytime I set my mind, God's glory shows up where I have settled. God's glory should, oh, there comes this moment when I'm preaching and I'm nervous and I'm anxious and I'm stumbling and I'm bumbling and I'm shaking. But then I get to this point where I say, I'm in it now. And I believe that God sent me to it. And if God sent me to it, let's go baby you gotta get in a position where you decide that i'm going to set my mind there is not no taking no for an answer that woman with the issue of blood got down on her hands and her knees because she recognized there was a multitude surrounding her but i won't let the multitude talk me out of my healing you gotta act like you only got one shot i only got one shot to get it done i've only got one shot to show up in this space this woman didn't give herself any other option and she did not allow herself to be discouraged in spite of the many things that were standing in her way. God told me that there were women who were in this room who struggled with setting their mind because they feel like someone else can do it. God told me to tell you, you got to act like you're his only option. God told me that you got to be so sure about this thing that you got to act like nobody else can do it but me. You got to be so sure about this thing that it doesn't matter who else grabs the microphone. It doesn't matter who else writes the song because God gave me something that only I can do. God gave me something that only I can produce. God gave me a child that only I can raise. God gave me a ministry and I'm the only one who can preach this. I'm the only one who can do it. There is no other option. It's just me. So I'm not scared when I see you doing you, baby. Because you got to do you so I can do me. God's counting on me. There are some people only I can reach. And there are some people that only you can reach. And if I let you stepping into you discourage me from stepping into me, then I'm a counterfeit. But I gotta be on the front line of where God has called me. And I need you to hold down your side of the line. Cause can't nobody do you the way that you do you, baby. But you gotta... You got to go to war with you to get that done. You got to go to war with you to get that done. You got to get sick of your own excuses. You got to get sick of your own backsliding. You got to make a decision that fear doesn't get to control me any longer. You got to make a decision that shame has got to let you go. You got to go to therapy. You got to get some trauma therapy because you got to make a decision. I'm not going to be a scared little girl anymore. I'm in my grown woman era and he's got things for me to do. I want you to turn to the woman next to you and tell you it's time for you to get on the front lines. It's time for you to get on the front lines. It's time for you to stop playing. It's time for you to get on the front lines. It's time for you to take it seriously. You got to be serious about this healing. You got to be serious about this breakthrough. The kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. It's time for you to get on the front line. It's time for you to go to war with your devils. Go to war with your demons. Um. I'm, uh, I'm preaching in Dallas on Sunday and God showed me this scripture in Luke 10 
And in this scripture in Luke 10, he's got these 70 disciples and he sends the 70 disciples out and they come back and they say, you know, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They're blown away by what God gave them. And Jesus says to them that that's not a big deal. I saw Satan fall from the sky like lightning. He says, I gave you power and authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy. I love this verse because it makes things, two things very clear to me. When Jesus himself says the power of the enemy, it means that in our mind, if we allow ourselves to believe that the enemy has no power, we will always be stopped in our tracks. Jesus says, I gave you power over all of the power of the enemy. The enemy does have enough power to keep you from stepping into who God has called you to be. He does have enough power to keep you from seeing your destiny properly. He did have some of the things that happened to us while we need the trauma therapist is a result of the power of the enemy showing up in our lives or other people's lives. But Jesus says, I gave you power over that. So when we begin to give ourselves no other option, it is the full recognition of the power we have in Jesus to overcome whatever power has been thrown our way. I wish I could say that the way that I feel it. That fear that has become normalized has enough power to keep you from being all that God knows you can be. That's why if you don't see it as a threat, you'll start sleeping with the enemy, not recognizing that you have the power to overcome the fear, the shame, the abandonment, sleeping with the very enemy you want to overcome because you don't recognize that no matter how normalized it has become in your family, in your friendship group, in your culture, it is on assignment to stop you in your tracks. And if it is stopping you, the power is working. So obedience is an act of resistance. Uh, I don't do this because I like it. I don't. I love y'all. <laughs> but I do this because obedience is an act of resistance. And I recognize that the only reason I don't want to do it is because I'm afraid that I'll be embarrassed, that I'll be ashamed, that I'm not smart enough. So if I don't do it, I am becoming obedient to the power of the enemy and stepping away from what God has called me to do. So I told God, as long as you keep showing up, I'll keep growing up. Because this thing has had enough power in the past. It had real power. But there is a greater name, a greater power. And I align myself with the greater power. Even if it means abandoning what makes me comfortable. Y'all sit down. <laughs> this is what it looks like when power begins to move in us. When we allow the power of God to confront what has had power in the past. When we see our opponent properly, you are powerful enough to do X, Y, and Z. But when I worship, when I create an environment for God's power to show up, it changes things. Then there comes this stage where we go from power moving in us into power moving through us. So there's people watching online, not in the room, who cannot hear another sermon or read another book that will further prepare them for where God is ready to take them. Their mind is set. 
They got everything they need. But they have a set mind with cold feet. They're not in here. <laughs> They're not in here. They're watching online from all over the world. I really got everything I need. I just don't trust what I have. Every time I hear a sermon, every time I pick up a book, it just reinforces what I already know. But I do have cold feet when it comes to activating. <laughs> the face you're making is making me think there may be one person in the room. <laughs> just one. <laughs> I want to show you guys a video from someone who can relate. Path I'm currently on towards discovering myself and my purpose. Hmm. So for the last month or so, God has had me on a two-word basis. And those two words are, trust me. Every single time I ask a question, I hear trust me. And honestly, I am grateful that the Lord finds it within himself to just continue repeating himself over and over again and not ghosting me because <laughs> I would ghost me at this point because I just keep asking and he keeps saying, trust me. I had found that I had become dependent on God in a way that almost diminished the fact that he had placed power within me. What I mean by that is him saying, trust me, is not just saying, trust me, he's saying, trust me me. I have placed discernment and wisdom, intuition within you. And when you feel that move, I have given you dominion. I have given you the wherewithal to move. And so what I am discovering is a new level of power. And as I walk lockstep with God, because he's saying, he is still saying, trust me, but it is the belief that I know that as I move, you are with me. We are in alignment. We are walking together and that through me, you are going to use me in all of these spaces and that you are telling me that I am equipped. I know what to do and in the places that I'm not equipped, your power is made perfect in my weakness so I don't even have to trip when I feel a little weak because yeah, come on, <laughs> you be the power. <laughs> and so there's just a new level of <clears throat> in my step and the purpose that God has shown me he just keeps telling me like I've laid out a path specifically for you and just trust me and I think what I'm discovering is who I'm going to need to be in order to lay hold of the blessing that's already mine and he's developing me and fortifying me in such a beautiful way. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at for now. <laughs> One of the things I love about her testimony is that she's had to recover from what I think many of us have had to recover from, and that is not trusting ourselves as much as God trusts us. I don't know if you've ever been like, God, are you sure? <laughs> Part of the reason why I love the text that really lays the foundation for being on the front lines is that it showed me so much about how God allows women to be on the front lines of what he's doing in the earth, while also taking in consideration where they are placed in the earth. I can go back to my text. First of all, I want to say this. If you feel anything like the way that woman felt, I want you to know that it is not uncommon for the vulnerability required to allow your transformation to live outside of you. It is excruciating to bear yourself that naked, to be seen, to reintroduce yourself into circles and situations where they were used to a certain version of who you are. Man, I, guys, I have a book coming out. It's called Power Moves. <laughs> Ignite your confidence and become a force. And the reason I wrote the book is because I realized that so many women have done a lot of work. Like, we do the courses, we write the books, uh, read the books, write the books, don't release them, but we do write them. 
we have the podcast, like we fill ourselves with all this information, but when it's time for it to actually come out, we don't do it because we are afraid of how us stepping into our power will disrupt our comfort zones. We're afraid that if I actually walk in this power that I may lose some friends or that people are not going to understand me. And it's one thing to be like, I'll do it by myself. I don't need nobody. But like, let's be honest. (laughs) I don't even know who this is that I am yet. And it is very restricting for us to have all of this power inside of us, but for it to have no place to go. What I love about this text is that it revealed to us that this woman, Jael, she was prepared for the moment when the front lines would come her way. Oh, she wasn't out like G.I. Jane in the middle of the battle with all of the other men. This battle came right to her doorstep. It still required her to move out of her comfort zone and that she was going to have to perform a task that quite literally only she could perform. But God was intuitive enough about who she was to understand that I have to position her in such a way that she can stretch herself without breaking herself. I think many times we don't move or allow the power to move through us because we are afraid that it will be such a drastic change from where we are right now. And because we don't want to flip the script that rapidly, we stay within not recognizing that it will be a becoming powerful in God. It won't be drastic overnight. And so God allows her opponent, he allows Sarah to quite literally meet her in her tent, in her domain, where she understands the landscape, where she understands the weapons that are available to her. He knew what was available to her and fixed the battle in such a way that she could experience victory and vulnerability vulnerability all at the same time. Sometimes we only picture ourselves with the vulnerability, not recognizing that with the vulnerability comes victory. We overcome by the, bl- by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That means that I am going to overcome, but it is going to require some vulnerability. And if I can't get comfortable with vulnerability, then I can never really taste victory because victory requires vulnerability. This woman gets on the front lines and she allows this enemy into her camp with the intent of making sure that he didn't get up again. God told me that for those of you who are in a position where you are wondering, what am I going to do with all of this vision, all of this power, all of this insight, all of this anointing that you have awakened me to, what am I going to do with it? God told me the only thing you need to do is not miss the moment when the battle comes to your doorstep. That you have to be sensitive enough to understand when I allow opportunities, situations to come to where you are, that you have to strike on who you are becoming in that moment. I wish I could say it better. The only way that I can really explain it is that sometimes we have these moments where we're praying that God would give us an opportunity. And then when the opportunity comes, we think that there's someone else more qualified to actually do it. This woman, JL, could have let him sleep in the tent and then went and got a soldier or a commander and say, hey, here he is. Can someone else come and take care of him? But she was sensitive enough to understand that there was something about what was standing in front of her and what God had placed inside of her that needed to connect. And it was on her to step fully in that moment. God told me to tell a woman in this room that you got to know when the battle is yours for the taking, you got to know when I'm giving you an opportunity opportunity to step into all that I have deposited on the inside of you. You've heard the words, you've heard the speeches. Now I hear God saying that it's striking time. And if you insist on someone else more qualified striking because it's going to be your first time, then you're never going to get started. But you're going to have to risk things getting bloody. You're going to have to risk them being messy. You're going to have to risk getting it right or getting it wrong. But if you don't take a chance, you're never going to see the plan, the role that you play in God. God's plan. You got to be willing to get on the front lines. Recognizing that you will have everything you need within reach. God brought the battle to her. 
She used a tent peg. She didn't have the same tools that the other soldiers had. She didn't have the same training that the other soldiers had. But what she did have was within reach that only she could grab. And whereas someone else may have looked at it and said, that's only good for a tent. She looked, oh, I don't know who you are, but you've got something in your hand that doesn't make sense to anybody else but you. You see it as a weapon and nobody else understands that you have a weapon in your hand. I hear God saying, don't drop the weapon. If I told you that that is what I'm going to use, to help you stop the plan of the enemy that's running rampant in your family don't you drop the weapon I hear God saying it is not just a degree I hear God saying it is not just a weapon I hear God saying that it is not just a book I hear God saying that is not just another witty idea that is a weapon in your hand and you may be the only person who sees it as a weapon God says that's the only thing that matters because when the battle comes to your doorstep you're going to have to use that thing that I gave you maybe it is just preaching maybe it is just singing maybe it is just writing but on the outside looking in you may not see what it is but God told me this thing is a weapon and I'm just waiting for the opportunity where I can strike in the area that God has allowed to come to my doorstep I don't know who you are but I hear God saying knock knock it's getting ready to come in your direction knock knock the battle has got your name on it knock knock I'm about to give you an opportunity to strike so I want to prophesy in this room right now that when the door knocks you'll have an ear to hear it when the door knocks you'll have an eye to see it I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would begin taking inventory over what God has given you I hear God saying that you got more to work with than you think I hear God saying stop looking at the other tools start looking at what's in your tent start looking at what's in your domain I got more than enough to help you overcome the enemy that has come your way. I hear God saying if you use it, I'll send my power to back it up. There is no way that the woman should have known exactly where to strike, but the moment she reached for it, God gave her insight on what to do with what God has given her. It's in your tent. It's already sitting in the house. It's already in the friendship circle. It's already running around in your mind. God gave you a vision for generational wealth and it doesn't even make any sense. But God says it's already in your tent. I wouldn't give you the vision if I wasn't gonna let it run up on you. I hear God saying, knock, knock, I'm on my way. I hear God saying, knock, knock, get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. You better start sharpening your tools. Get ready. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the moment. Keep your eyes open. It's coming. Keep your ears open. It's coming. Don't miss the moment. I hear God saying there's an enemy with your name on it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss the moment. You got everything you need. Don't miss the moment. That devil has your name on it. Don't miss the moment. That generational curse has your name on it. That means you're the only one who can take it down. So you got to know what you're working with. And you got to trust what you're working with. And it doesn't have to look like what everyone else has. You don't need anything else. Not another lecture. Not another person sharing the idea and telling you how good it is. Over, You already know you got something. You just got cold feet. And it's okay. Because a lot of us know what it's like to have cold feet. <sighs> to be afraid that if I start it, I can't sustain it. To be afraid that if I shake things up that I'll be so lonely I'll go running back. To be afraid of failure, a lot of us understand this. But you don't get the strength to do it until you actually activate. In scripture where it says that the Lord will order our steps. Some of us are like, 
we need MapQuest. Like, I need to, like, thank you, appreciate you. But I'm more of a, like, give me the whole picture. And God's more of a, like, a order them when you take them. But you got to give yourself no other option but yes. Last point, we got two minutes. Y'all can stand, I'm going to close. Power moves, take your time, come on. Power moves in you, then power's got to move through you. Then you get to this space where you recognize that power is also moving for you. Okay. The last part of this text, Barack finally catches up and he's looking for the man that escaped. He's looking for the man and he comes to JL's tent. He gets to JL's tent and he says, I'm looking for a man and she's like, come, I'm gonna show him to you. Not recognizing that what she's gonna show him is a job that's already been taken care of. Sometimes I find myself feeling like Barack in these moments, feeling like I'm catching up to an enemy that got away. And I'm still tracking down this same old issue, same old concern. And then God shows me that that thing you were worried about, I already took care of it. <laughs> If you've ever wondered if someone would understand you, if you've ever wondered if you'd move to the city and find connection, if you've ever wondered about something and finally got to it and God was like, I already took care of that for you, then you know what it's like when power moves for you. What I love about the last part of this text though is that it happened in the context of partnership. He had an unsuspecting partner and a woman named JL. Before we go tonight, I want to take a minute and allow you to have an unsuspecting partner and the person sitting beside you. I want you to grab that woman like we did earlier. Every time. I want you to share with this woman an area in your life, in your heart, in your soul, where you need God to partner with you, where you need God's power to move for you. I just want you to take a minute and just unpack that to the extent that you're comfortable. It could be broad strokes in my healing, in my relationships, in my finances. You don't have to get super detailed. But what is an area in your life where you need God's power to work for you? Take your minute. If you're watching online, I want you to type it in the chat. I want you to type an area in your life where you need God's power to work for you. Is it in your body? Is it in your marriage? Is it in your creativity? Type it out. When that woman gets finished sharing with you, I want you to hug on her. Love on that woman, squeeze on her. If you're watching online, you see another woman's need. I just want you to say, I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you.
What I love about this text is that Barack had to be willing to look in unexpected places. Barack had to be willing to look in the tent of a woman to find that it had already been taken care of. You may have to look for the answer to your prayer in unexpected places. So Spirit of the living God, I pray right now that every woman in this room in need of a touch from God that only God can give, in need of breakthrough from God that only God can do, that you would help her to start opening her eyes to look in unexpected places. I thank you, God, that the spirit of prophecy is in this room and that you are going to begin prophesying to this woman the areas where she needs to look. I hear the Holy Spirit saying, look again. I hear God saying that I'm already moving. You just can't see it. I hear God saying that when you finally start searching me with your whole heart, that you will see that I've already gone ahead of you. And so, God, I thank you that you are giving this woman the ability to shift her focus no longer will she look for all of the things that could go wrong she's going to start looking for the ways that you were showing up because she understands if you're showing up in one area then you'll show up in all of the areas i thank you god for the woman she's touching that that woman she's touching has breakthrough on the way i thank you god that the woman she's touching hasn't seen her best days yet i thank you god that the woman she's touching is going to have an encounter her with joy that gives her her hope back that gives her her peace back I thank you God that the woman that she's touching is going to get on the front lines and when she gets on the front lines she's going to recognize that she's got backup that all of heaven's resources are backing her up I thank you God that she's not alone I thank you God that I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging for bread I thank you God that you take her seriously and that no weapon formed against her has prospered. I thank you, God, that she's still here. I thank you, God, that she's still breathing. I bleed the blood of Jesus over this woman. I dispatch angels over her dwelling place. I dispatch angels over her finances. She may be on the front lines, but she doesn't see the angels that are going ahead of her. I thank you, God, that every crooked path will be made straight. I thank you, God, that you'll give her the word she needs needs for the meeting. You give her the strength she needs for the building. I thank you, God, that she's just getting started. And because she's getting started, that I won't be on this journey alone. Because I'm getting started too. Because I'm answering the call too. Because I heard from you, God. And because I heard from you, my soul says yes. My mind says yes. My feet say yes. Father, I thank you for divine strategy. I thank you for ordered steps. I thank you for peace, for power, for breakthrough. And God, selfishly, I thank you for Woman Evolve. I thank you for connection. I thank you for joy. And I thank you for what you've already decided to do in the city of Los Angeles. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.